In essence, all humans are the same. We are essentially clones of each other. From the moment we are born, we are hardwired with many of the same traits. We smile when we are happy. We feel a sense of justice. We all share similar ideas about morality. All societies, primitive and advanced, have mechanisms that cause them to be fluid. The mechanisms might be markets or laws, governments or unions. Society should harness the mechanisms that generate the things that we all share. Things that we consider to be sacred, such as freedom, leisure, and happiness. We all share these ideas because they are innate. They are embedded into our DNA and expressed by our very nature. Democracy, voting as a system of participatory self-governance, is supposed to be one of these self-correcting mechanisms. It should generate a society that values our most important ideals. But there is a major flaw that's been exploited. The man who found out how to exploit this weakness was Edward Bernays. He is considered the father of public relations and one of the major contributors to the field of marketing. Bernays believed that people were inherently stupid, that they could be easily persuaded not by rational thought, but by appealing to their emotions. If people are evil, stupid, irrational, and if they are ruled by a mob-like mentality, then, as Bernays reasoned, they must be controlled. Democracy must be shaped, or at least prevented from functioning fully. To do this, Bernays went to the teaching of his uncle, Sigmund Freud. Freud believed that people were influenced by unconscious desires. With this knowledge, Bernays concluded that you couldn't influence the public by appealing to rational thought, but instead, their irrational emotions. In the 1920s, one of Edward Bernays' first clients was the American Tobacco Corporation. At the time, there was a taboo against women smoking in public. The president of the American Tobacco Corporation, George Hill, complained to Bernays that his company was losing half of its potential market. Bernays hired psychologists to figure out why. The conclusion was that cigarettes were a form of male sexual power, but that women could undermine this power by smoking themselves. It was a form of women's rights. In one of his first experiments, Bernays was able to convince a group of rich debutantes to pull out their cigarettes during the Easter parade in New York City. Bernays informed the newspaper that he heard that these women were going to be protesting. He knew the media would show up, and when they did, Bernays gave the women the signal to light up in front of the cameras with banners reading, Torches of Freedom. The next day, the event was covered not just in the New York papers, but around the world. The experiment was a success. Edward Bernays had broken the taboo in just one event. Soon, it became a powerful symbol for women to smoke. Just by smoking, women were sending a message that they were equal to men, that they were just as powerful and independent. But the reality is, smoking cigarettes doesn't make you powerful. Bernays realized that he could use products to appeal not to a person's rationality, but to their emotions. Just by making a person feel special, powerful, sexy, independent, proud, happy, or excited, he could manipulate the general masses. Soon after this event, the sales of cigarettes to women skyrocketed. In 1928, Edward Bernays wrote, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. The business sector in America had become interested in Edward Bernays' new method of manipulating the public. At the time, business had appealed to people to buy their products because they had to have them. They were products that we all depend on like toothpaste and shoes. Bernays would advise the private sector against this. Instead, he would appeal to people's emotional desires. Cars would no longer be sold because they were reliable machines, but instead they gave the driver a sense of freedom, luxury, the feeling of being special, that they might be better than their neighbor. Paul Mazur of Lehman Brothers, a man who employed Bernays, said, We must shift America from a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire. People must want new things before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desire must overshadow his needs. The rest of corporate America agreed. Soon, demand for Bernays' services became overwhelming. Other public relations companies began to proliferate around America. Almost every major corporation came to use the method of public relations. They would appeal to people's most primal desires based not on democratic values, but on market principles. Because of these new methods, the private sector became all-powerful. Some companies, such as the United Fruit Company, had owned massive quantities of land in Guatemala. The company had come to support a series of dictators in the country. 
1951, President Arbenz became the democratically elected president of Guatemala on the platform of reform. One of his reforms was to unleash the grip of United Fruit over the country. The Congress voted for land reform in which they would buy unused parcels of land held by United Fruit and hand that land over to poor families to be used. While the public was overwhelmingly supportive of the reforms, a tiny group of elites and the United Fruit Company became threatened. The company turned to Bernays to deal with what they saw as a crisis. Because Arbenz was so popular, Bernays decided not to manipulate public opinion in Guatemala, but instead, he would appeal to the United States government. At the time, the threat of Soviet communism was in every facet of American life. Even though Guatemala was a capitalist country, Bernays had to convince the U.S. and its public that Arbenz was a puppet of the Soviet, even though there was no connection. Bernays had to use people's fears on themselves and turn Arbenz into the single greatest threat to American democracy. Edward Bernays gathered a group of journalists from America to travel to Guatemala to meet with a small group of anti-Arbenz politicians. They convinced the journalists that Arbenz was a communist with links to the Soviet Empire. At the same time, Bernays created a phony, independent news agency in the United States called the Middle America Information Bureau. Their task was to overwhelm the media with threats of an Arbenz government by saying that Moscow was to use Guatemala as a base to attack America. The plan worked. All over America, newspapers and people were talking about an imminent attack by this small, almost completely defenseless country. While all this was happening, United Fruit Company was lobbying the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower became convinced that Guatemala was a menace to American democracy. He ordered the CIA to overthrow the country by arming and training a rebel army. Then, the CIA created what they called a terror campaign by bombing Guatemala City. On June 27, 1954, Arbenz fled to Mexico. Eventually, Carlos Armas seized power and became dictator. He angered the public by reversing land reform. With a request from the CIA, Armas created the National Committee of Defense Against Communism. The group is generally acknowledged to be Latin America's first modern death squad. He purged the government and trade unions of people suspected of left-wing sympathies, banned political parties and peasant organizations, and restored the secret police force. All of this eventually led to the Guatemalan Civil War in which 200,000 civilians were killed, most of them murdered by the U.S.-supported government and death squads. While the name Edward Bernays is unknown to most Americans, he's had a major impact on our lives. He worked for the Wilson, Hoover, and Eisenhower administration. He rubbed shoulders with the most powerful men in America. And he was employed by almost every major corporation in the U.S., including New Jersey Bell Telephone, Procter & Gamble, American Tobacco Company, General Electric, Dodge Motors, CBS, and Bethlehem Still. The real irony is that Bernays was convinced that the public had to be controlled because they were irrational, that democracy had to be prevented. But in doing so, he actually made people irrational and turned them into the mob he so feared. Edward Bernays undermined democracy, the one mechanism that has self-perfecting features, and replaced that with another mechanism, one that brings out the worst human qualities such as greed, selfishness, power, envy, Bernays played on our pretensions, our lusts, fears, ignorance, and dreams, all in the name of another mechanism that runs societies, all in the name of private enterprise. That is what he referred to as the invisible government. The people who control this great mechanism are the ones who have the power and the money to manipulate entire societies for their will, for their beliefs, and for their greed. They have capitalized on our most primal and fear-based emotions and exploited them turning citizens into truly irrational beings.